I'll give you the three, the two, and the silent one, and then we'll get started. So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, December 16th, 2021. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's Equity Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams live on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done on a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fast, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott. Dr. Hager. Present. Ms. Mack. Present. Ms. Pastor. Present. Mr. Thomas. Present. Ms. Fast, please call the roll of the staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Yarborough. Present. Dr. McComas. Present. Mr. Handy. Present. Please call and note the names of all staff members participating in the meeting. I think we just did that. Request if there are any other members participating on the call that you have not named. Sure. Um, Dr. Holmes. Present. Dr. Elmendorf. Present. Ms. Schubert. Present. Mr. Stoll. Present. Are there any other um, staff members who I did not call? Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So I think we can get started and um, we have only one item of business on our agenda today, but it is a very exciting one where we're going to hear about our magnet programs overview with a presentation by Dr. Elmendorf, Ms. Schubert and Ms. Stoll. So if you guys want to get started, feel free. I don't know if Dr. McComas, did you want to say anything before we start? She yeah, thank you. I think let's just go ahead and okay, jump right great. in. It's, it is going to be a great discussion, I think. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yes, and we are really excited to share an overview of Magnet Programs with you, which we know is um, directed by Magnet Policy 6400. Uh, but as you'll hear today, Board Policy 0100 is a critical lens through which we operate Magnet Programs as well, specifically the portion indicating that it is a priority to recruit and increase participation of persons from underrepresented groups in school programs. Um, with that, at this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Ms. Schubert and Mr. Stoll, who will walk us through how we have used uh, magnet programs to increase the diversity and equitable access in our system. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Elmendorf, and thank you to the committee. We are very excited to kind of, uh, to share with you an overview of magnet programs today. Um, so next slide, please. In our teaching and learning framework, Baltimore County Public School holds the core belief that instruction must be accessible for all students. Accessible instruction promotes equity for students and their learning, irrespective of student backgrounds and ability, and disrupts disproportionate outcomes. Next slide, please. We wanted to start by just introducing you to our magnet team. You will meet Mr. Stoll very shortly, but our magnet programs are led by Mr. Brian Stroll, and we provide direct support um, to schools um, through specialist Liberty Greig, resource teacher Kathleen Mooney, and administrative support is provided by Ms. Paige Single. The Magnet Schools Assistance Program Grant, which some of you might have just heard about in Curriculum Committee, is led by Supervisor Corey Roach, Specialist Kathy O'Neill and Fiscal Assistant Ms. Jennifer Martin. The MSAP grant, a $15 million federally awarded grant, is in year five of a five-year five grant cycle and will sunset on September 30th, 2022. The uh, Magnet team in Baltimore County is small, but they are mighty. 
Next slide. So our 32 schools with 115 magnet programs have a diverse body of students from various socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. Our guiding vision is that magnet programs will assist students in becoming globally competitive citizens by providing unique educational choice options aligned with students' interests, talents, and abilities. Magnet programs by definition are not available as comprehensive school program options. Next slide. Over 17,000 magnet students representing about 15% of the Baltimore County Public School student population benefited from improved academic achievement, diverse student enrollment, increased cultural competence among students, increased student attendance rates, higher graduation rates, innovative curricula, and specialized teaching staff. Magnet programs at the secondary level are typically required course sequences that students take in place of other elective courses. So examples of that would be visual and performing arts or career and technology education completer programs. At the elementary level and at some middle and high schools, a magnet theme is integrated across the content areas. Examples would include STEAM at the elementary schools and the IB programs at elementary and middle schools. In the current magnet application cycle, 6,820 students made a total of 17,144 program selections. So keep in mind that students and families can select up to three programs when applying to a magnet program. And those 6,820 students with 17,144 program selections were applying for approximately 3,600 magnet seats. Next slide, please. So we wanted to talk a little bit about how students access our magnet programs. Generally, a student's eligible to participate in magnet programs if the student resides in Baltimore County. Uh, the common exceptions to this would be students who are homeless or currently attending a BCBS school and are children of a BCBS employee who may reside outside of the county. We accept elementary applications for grades kindergarten, first and second middle school applications for grade six only, and high school applications for grade nine, and for some of our magnet programs, grade 10 and even possibly grade 11. It, it varies program to program. The grades for which high school applications are accepted for each program is provided in the magnet brochure and on the magnet programs website. BCBS encourages parents of all students, including students with disabilities and English language learners, to consider the magnet program options and actively partners in this goal with the Office of Special Education, CCAC, and the Office of English Language Learners. It's important to note that students with disabilities and English language learners receive the same support services provided in other comprehensive schools, and students with disabilities are entitled to transportation services if BCPS um, it is a current and necessary accommodation requirement on the student's IEP. I will also add when students are applying and perhaps taking an assessment at the high school level that IEP accommodations are provided for those assessments as well. Next slide, please. We also wanted to give you a sense of what this looks like in this current school year. Each year, magnet programs along with the 32 magnet schools coordinate a very robust marketing campaign to ensure that our families are aware of the magnet application options. In addition to English, magnet brochures are available in 11 other languages. Numerous internal and external hyperlinks were incorporated into the online brochure to make them interact an interactive resource for our parents and our students. This year, the application system opened at noon on September 5th, and it closed at 1 p.m. on November 5th. BCPS hosted virtual application information meetings for parents on four dates, and those were held in English and offer, also offered in multilingual formats with interpreters. All events were uh, well attended. I was able to attend most of those. Throughout the month of October, our amazing 32 BCPS Magnet Schools host showcase events where they invite prospective students and their families um, into the school to visit. Uh, last year, these occurred virtually. This year, most of them were virtually with some occurring face to face. And the goal with those showcase events is to help families and students better understand the Magnet program, meet the administrators, meet the teachers, meet the students currently participating in the program or working in the program.
This year, high school assessments will occur in December. In fact, some are occurring today <laughs> through January, um, and those are mostly in a face-to-face -face format with some virtual options. Um, and then finally, school year 22-23 admission results will be released on February 4th for elementary and middle school applicants and March 4th for our high school applicants. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the MAG program's admissions process. Um, all of our admission decisions are made in accordance with Superintendent's Rule 6400, which is available from BCPS's and the Magnet Program's website. And we do have priority placements at each grade level. Um, kindergarten applicants who have an older sibling in the Magnet Program to which they're applying receive a sibling priority placement before the lotteries are run. And that's only the sibling priority is only done at kinder, for kindergartners. And only, and that only occurs if the older sibling will still be in the school the year the kindergartner starts. So that's an important caveat. Um, for all grade levels, elementary, middle, and high school, children of employees who work in the magnet schools to which their child is applying receive the priority placement before the lottery is run. Um, at the high school level, to receive this priority, the student must also have earned a score of at least 80% in the evaluation process. At the high school level, there is also a priority placement for students who earn the highest scores on the magnet assessments that are conducted by the schools. Um, we're able to fill up to 20% of the seats in a program with students who earn the highest assessment scores. So, for example, a program with 20 seats, we would be able to fill four seats prior to the lottery, and then the other 16 seats would be um, filled by lottery. After the priority placements are completed, the remaining seats are filled by lottery. For elementary and middle school programs, students are either offered a seat or placed on a wait list through the lottery selection process. And for high school programs, students who earn a total of 80% or more are given first consideration for placement. And they're either offered a seat or if all of the seats are filled, um, they're placed on the waiting list first. And then after that, students are offered placement or added to the wait list in descending order of their total score. So after the students who received 80%, then we would see the students with 79% and 78% and on all the way down until uh, we reach zero. Next slide. So we wanted to talk this afternoon a little bit about who are our students who are accessing magnet programs. We're going to share with you some data that represent um, our elementary students, our middle school students, our high school students, and then we do have some data um, in aggregate for our K-12 um, students as well. So these data that you're looking at represent our elementary enrollments in grades kindergarten through five in the four BCPS magnet schools that Mr. Stoll shared with you before for the past three school years. So demographic enrollment data, as you can see at the elementary level, has remained fairly stable with a slight increase in the last three years in the number of Hispanic students enrolled in elementary magnet programs. Next slide, please. So along the lines of elementary school, um, our enrollment is fairly equally divided amongst male and female students. In school year 2021, 11.4% of our elementary magnet students had an IEP. It's important to note in the same school year that the overall BCPS population of students across all of our schools uh, with disabilities was 13.21%. So magnet 11.4, system 13.21. 7.9% of our elementary magnet students were English language learners and overall for Baltimore County Public Schools for the system, same percentage, 7.9% were English language learners. Next slide, please. Okay, so these data represent middle school enrollments, that's grades six to eight in the 12 Baltimore County Public School Magnet programs for the past three school years. The demographic enrollment at the middle school has remained fairly stable with the exception of a slight increase in the number of Black and Afri African American students, Hispanics, and white students uh, that are enrolled in our magnet programs over the last three years. Next slide, please. 
At the middle school level, enroll enrollment is fairly equally divided between male and female students. Um, in the 2021 school year, 13.6% of middle magnet students had an IEP. Um, in comparison to the total population for Baltimore County, where the students with disabilities was 13.21%, so they're pretty equivalent. Um, when we look at our ESOL population, our English language learners, um, we had 5.2% of our middle magnet students who were English language learners, and Baltimore County has 7.9% of ELs across the system. Next slide, please. So these data represent our high school students. So these are students in grades 9 through 12 in the 16 magnet high schools um, across the last three years. So demographic enrollment data at the high school level has remained fairly stable with the exception of an increase in the last three years in the number of black African-American students enrolled in high school magnet programs and a decline in the number of white students enrolled in high school magnet programs. Next slide, please. So at the high school level, um, it's interesting. This is where we do see um, a discrepancy um, in enrollment data across gender. So you can see that 44.8% um, of our students were male in school year 2021 and 55.1% were female. So we do see a discrepancy there. Um, in that same school year, 2021, 9.3% of high school magnet students had an IEP. If you remember from previous slides, the system average in the same school year was 13.21%. Um, and English language learners, uh, we were at 7.9% across the system with 2% of our high school magnet students were English language learners. We, Magnet Programs continues to monitor enrollment data on an annual basis to assess the extent to which Magnet Program enrollment reflects the diversity of Baltimore County Public Schools. Next slide, please. So this data represents um, BCPS overall enrollment across all BCPS schools and programs. For the 2021 and school year, it also shows the magnet enrollment data for the same year at the 32 magnet schools. In 2021, the overall Baltimore County Public School population of students with a disability was 13.21%. In the same school year, 8.9% of overall magnet populations were students with disabilities. And in that school year, the overall population of students who were ELs was 7.9%. And in the same school year, 3.6% of the magnet population were, were ELs. Next slide. So we know that was a lot of numbers <laughs> that we just threw at all of you, um, but at this point, are there any questions from the committee members? Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. This is Lisa. Or go ahead, Christian. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just had questions about if there, I know there wasn't any farms data or, or students that um, do have free and reduced meals services uh, on this PowerPoint, but do you have any data regarding the percentage of BCPS students that uh, do have free and reduced meals and the percentage of magnet students that that we can compare? I do not have that data at the ready right now, but that is certainly okay. data that, that we can get. Okay. That was, not, that was my prelim only preliminary question. Thank you. Great question. Lisa, Ms. Mack. Could we go back to the high school slide, please? Um, I'm sorry, the one that talks about the process. Thank you. Um, do you have any data on um, how often we get to to the third level where we say the random lottery by descending score 79, 78, 77? Um, 
my experience just with my kids, excuse me, my dogs barking, um, attending a magnet high school was that there were often wait lists. So do we ever get to number three, I guess is what I'm saying, the random lottery by descending scores, or do we fill the slots typically with number one and number two? So I'm, I'm happy to address that and thank you for the question. Uh, we do have programs where we have offered every student who's applied to a high school program and who's gone through the assessment process with a seat in the program. So we do have programs where we exhaust the waiting list and this provides students, you know, that they don't have to receive the highest scoring scores to get into the programs, but they and they have an opportunity to participate in some of these exceptional programs. Um, we do have other programs where we will move into the lists, um, into the third tier of this, so to speak. Um, and, and those are at some of our, even our most popular high schools where we have the highest number of applicants. So, so you do see, see that children in the third tier are getting access or having access to the programs? We do. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question about the process as well. Uh, so having gone in the being in the middle of this right now, um, I know that students rank their top three programs, then they take the tests. So are they offered a single spot it, or is there a chance that they could be offered multiple spots in a program that, and then they choose? So students do make up to three selections and, and most students do. They're actually not rank ordered. So there is a possibility that a student could be offered three and then they have a tough decision to make, right? Um, students could be on the wait list for three as well. They're not rank ordered in any way, but good question. No, I, 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 this is whole process, I guess that is so new to me. Um, and given that it is such a competitive process and there are children who start in programs and then choose to transfer back to their home schools, um, do you do exit interviews or anything with those students to find out why it wasn't a good fit in order to prevent that from happening because it is such an investment for these kids. Mr. Stoll, you want to respond to that? Sure. So we, we primarily deal with the admissions process and the appeal process that happens and that coincides with that. Um, the schools do typically conduct some type of interview with the students if they are, if the parents are requesting that they are moved back to their home school or if the students are requesting that. But we don't collect that data in our office that's maintained in the schoolhouse. Okay, it might be good information to have, you know, should should there be a program with with, uh, you know, multiple children leaving potentially. Um, and then my last question is when you randomize um, for the random lottery applicants, which I, I know is the bulk of the applicants who, who get spots, is it stratified randomization by these categories of IEP? Um, and uh, English language learners so that you can have a representative sample of students that are accepted or is it random and then it's just kind of hanging out that way that it looks somewhat representative of those who apply? So the process is purely a random lottery selection process. Um, our goal is as we go into this process is to recruit a diverse applicant pool. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that every parent and every student in Baltimore County who potentially has an interest in our programs receives the information and the support they need in order to go through the application process. Um, as Ms. Schubert pointed out, we work closely with the Office of Special Education and CCAC and the ESOL office to especially target students who may not think that magnet programs are viable options for them and and let them and give them the accurate information that these are truly programs that are intended for all students and and try to encourage them to apply as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Ms. Pastor? Oh, Th Mr. Thomas, do you have a question? Yes, thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, I'm going to kind of touch on some of the, the things that many, you might remember from the policy review committee meeting on Monday uh, when we were kind of extending out from the policy and discussing the superintendent's role that is on the screen right here. Uh, my first question is, uh, middle school students no longer have to take a test to get into a magnet program or to be in a lottery. So what are some of the findings uh, from 
that uh, from no longer requiring a test and now just having a randomization pool. Uh, can you expand on some of those findings? So if we could pull up the slide with the uh, diversity of, of the middle schools, um, I think that what we find is that we get a, a relatively even cross section of students um, represented diversity wise, um, gender wise um, in our programs. So I think that by eliminating the admission criteria, removing that barrier that was existed for a lot of fifth graders applying to a middle school, um, we've been able to provide more opportunities for more students from a variety of backgrounds and um, experiences and you know, socioeconomic groups to participate in these extremely valuable magnet program. Thank you. Do you have some like rough data from, I don't know, from memory of what those percentages might have looked like before the assessment? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that information. Here. OK, I understand. That's that's OK. Um, so my next question is, in high school, there is still that testing requirement. And so what does the test look like for our uh, students that are entering into the arts programs, the uh, uh, programs at Carver, for example, the uh, the programs at Patapsco? Um, and what are some of the barriers, I guess, for students that have had the privilege of taking dance classes for years and years and years compared to those students that haven't had that opportunity due to financial reasons? Ms. Hubert, did you want to address that? Okay. I'm happy to do so. Um, thank you for that question, Mr. Thomas. Um, so one of the goals of magnet programs as we are moving forward is to look at the standardization and the centralization of magnet assessments. So I will use dance as my first example. Uh, currently we have dance magnet programs. Let's see how well my memory serves me at Patapsco High School, the Carver Center, and Milford Mill Academy. I remembered all three. Um, and that was one of the first assessments we took on as a standardized and centralized uh, assessment process, meaning that a student um, could apply to all three dance programs. They only have to assess once, and it is the same assessment um, for all three of those schools. And we have shifted that assessment process to um, what I like to refer to as the potential for talent. So the change there was students used to be able to come to the assessment with a choreographed dance routine. Um, as you can imagine, and this is someone with two left feet, right? If I've had years of dancing experience, my choreographed routine might look different than a student who perhaps has not had formal training or perhaps doesn't have access to the resources um, to, to have a dance choreographed for them. The new centralized assessment, we teach a dance routine in the assessment and students dance it back, which we believe is a shift to a more equitable assessment. You also asked about other arts programs. Um, students are able to submit portfolios of work. Um, culinary students, um, um, they take a math test that really focuses on skills related to, um, to cooking, halving a recipe, doubling a recipe. They create a brochure that speaks to kind of their interest in the culinary fields. Um, when we move to in-person assessments, um, they do have the opportunity at Strayer University to, to bake. One year it was a biscuit. Um, so, but our goal is to move towards these standardized and centralized assessments across all of our magnet programs that really look to assess the potential for talent as opposed to um, the mastery of talent, if that if that makes sense. That does. Uh, thank you. And so I guess from the perspective of some teachers, when I was co conversing with teachers that are instructors at the dance programs or or are in charge of the arts programs, you know, it's interesting to ha hear their perspective and how they're saying, oh, well, we have some students in this class that are have had years and years and years of, of dance experience and other students that don't. And so trying to find that level of like, you know, where to teach at, where, where to start teaching, what's the best uh, course of action is something that, that, that maybe they're struggling with. And I was wondering if like, are there a kind of distinctions like in in, in, in levels in these magnet programs for, for people like that, like an intermediate versus like uh, experience uh, kind of positioning? I know that I'm referencing like elementary school and fifth grade when we were in our different groupings based on uh, reading proficiency and, and reading different books. Is that something that similarly happens in these magnet programs or is that something that uh, is it kind of all standard and up to kind of school autonomy and teacher discretion? 
Yeah, if I may um, address this question, and certainly I'll turn it over to the team if they have more to add afterwards. So I, I think it's a fantastic question, right? Because when we look at magnets, you know, people have many conceived notions about magnet, right? Should it just be for those who are the top of the top or should it be for those who have the potential and for us to to give them a level playing field um, as well. And so um, first, I just want to clarify that your question around having a range of capacity or ability um, is a reality in every single classroom, in every grade level and every content level. Um, for those of us who have been classroom teachers, I never once experienced a class of students who everyone was performing at the same level. And I taught advanced placement classes and general classes as well. Um, and so I would say that is not an unusual context for any teacher in any subject or any grade level. The way you address that is really your skill as a teacher and your pedagogical skill, right? It, this is where the importance of small group instruction, pulling groups of kids and focusing on the specific uh, skill sets that they need direct immediate feedback on to improve their performance. And so that really is the methodology of teaching to address a wide array of capacities within a grade level. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of clarify that that is not unique to magnets. That's not unique to an, any, an application process. Um, and when we think about, you know, we're bringing this here today specifically to put our lens of equity um, when uh, this subject, right? Um, and when we think about exactly as Ms. Schubert described this idea of access um, and equity and access for those with potential, not necessarily those who have um, mastery or those who maybe have um, are fortunate enough to have many advantages to have them accelerate earlier in their life than perhaps some of their peers do. So I hope that I, I, I answered your question um, in a way that helps you understand that that is something that every classroom teacher deals with. Um, and, and historically, school systems have had over decades um, many sorting systems, right? That we, we, we sort of have this very old fashioned 19th century factory model, right, where we're going to sort you into like groups. But we know sorting people into like groups is really not separate isn't equal, right? Um, and we also know that um, the research shows that students actually learn more and benefit from being in um, a mixed grouping. They learn from their peers. They can see their peers performing at different levels and can learn from them as well. And so, uh, but that goes against what has been the factory model of organizing schools that really extends back to the 1890s and the 1920s. And so we really are constantly working to um, construct school systems that create more equitable access and opportunity uh, that move us more towards tailoring instruction and education and away from a one size fits all. So um, at that, I'll turn it over to the team. You probably have more <laughs> to add. What differentiation was the first thought that came to my mind as well, Dr. McCoy's. Awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing. The, oh, sorry, Mr. Albendor or Dr. Yeah, I was just going to, you know, as a former arts teacher, a former music teacher, I've had, you know, classes where I've had to differentiate exhaustively because of somebody who's never put the instrument in their hand before compared to someone who's been taking private lessons, you know, since they've been two years old. So uh, I concur with Dr. McComas. Most or all of our content areas have some type of uh, pretty hefty differentiation needs to take up needs to take place. And I would think the answer is, is the same as that. Thank you. And I, would, I will just add, um, please know when, when we talk about differentiation, we acknowledge that's hard. It's hard work. It's hard. It takes a lot of effort, um, but it's truly where students benefit from the attention um, and the expertise of the teacher because we know anytime you have customized feedback and uh, smaller group attention, um, a greater yield happens as a result of that. I, I used to in my classroom, I had a table and I taught high schoolers. So this this still applies to high school students. Good pedagogy is good pedagogy. I had a 
a rectangular table in the one corner of my classroom and I called it my kitchen table and I said come on over come sit at the kitchen table with me and that's where I would look at their writing samples and we would have involved conversations around um, their writing expression because I was social studies so we did a lot of writing in my classes and and we would talk more deeply about concepts that maybe they were stopping at a shallow level and we need to kind of uh, help them make greater connections uh, with the concepts to make sure that we are re reaching the rigor of the standards. Thank you, Dr. McComas, and thank Hi. you for all for the responses. Uh, I love the comparison you had. You're recognizing that this is not something specific to just magnet programs. This is what happens in every content area, and hearing uh, your experiences as a teacher, it really kind of reinforced that, and, 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 and thank you for allowing me to see it that way. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. And so uh, going back to the superintendent's rule, um, at, a lot, at the PRC meeting, we had a, a brief conversation about the 20% um, of applicants that scored the highest. First, I was wondering if you could explain the scoring process to the committee, since I know that some may not be familiar with the scoring process. And second, uh, kind of discuss the 20% further and uh, maybe how that, or I, I could see that creating some sort of, not being the most equitable way to to reinforce something. If the purpose of a magnet program is to have access for everyone, then awarding you know the 20% highest applicants to go into the magnet program, that doesn't seem like that's awarding everyone. That's is initially awarding kind of the top achieving individuals. When when you're entering into the magnet program, you're not entering in with any guarantee at all. Um, so I just wanted to share that and ask if we could uh, discuss those two things. So I'll ask the team to describe sort of the technical process of that and then we can I'd like to help us facilitate some discussion around um, this our our larger movement towards a more equitable structure. Thank you. So I can speak to the evaluation process and, and truly it varies from school to school and program to program across the district. Um, so we have 16 high schools that offer magnet programs. Two of those high schools are under the Magnet Schools Assistance Program grant, and there are no evaluation or assessments involved. It's purely a lottery, and that's Newtown and Overly High School. Um, we have, of the 14 other high schools, we have um, 12 of those high schools use uh, we use a academic evaluation as part of the evaluation process. So part of the points the student received in the evaluation would come from an academic review. That's actually done by our office um, in-house, so the schools aren't involved in that process. And then the, four, all the, the 14 schools also conduct a some type of assessment at the school level. And those can vary from uh, a paper and pencil assessment to a, a performance based assessment um, and the performance based assessments can include a variety of things. Um, for example, it could be an interview. It could be um, a demonstration as, as Ms. Schubert was talking about. You know, the teacher shows them how to do a particular skill and then ask the students to then repeat that and, and demonstrate that back. You know, and really they're looking for that propensity to be able to learn and progress and be successful in the program. Um, so it varies a great deal from school to school. Um, Patapsco and Carver are the two schools where it's only performance based assessments. Um, there is no academic evaluation involved, and those are two of our art schools. And then the other schools, it's a combination of that assessment that the school conducts and the academic review. And the way that uh, we've structured this is the majority of the points at least 60% of the points in the evaluation process or 60 has to come from the assessment that the students take at the schools and then up to 40% could come from an academic evaluation. Um, the schools have a large say in what the admission criteria or the assessment of components are um, because we try to help them gear it towards the specific programs and the philosophy for their particular school. Um, so if that helps, um, for all of the programs, the total possible points is 100. And so, you know, then the students earn a particular score. We, we process those scores in our office, and then we use those scores, as you can see in this slide, um, in the selection process, the tiered selection process. 
Uh, we do, as you indicated, offer 20% of the seats to the students who score the highest scores on the assessment components. Those are the components that the schools conduct. It doesn't involve the academic review, so we're not looking for the top highest academic performing students. What we're looking for are students who have a, are able to demonstrate a high propensity for a success and interest in those programs. And so that kind of provides a seed for the program so that the other students who are entering the programs, they have, uh, as, as Dr. McComas was, was speaking to, you know, that diversity in the classroom and the ability to see other students performing at different levels. And it, and it raises the ability level and the success level of all the students in the school um, because they have some students who are top performing students as well as every other range of student within the program. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Uh, it, it does, yes. I, I didn't realize that the uh, percentages for the 20% uh, only come from the assessments and not from the entire academic achievement and the entire scoring uh, for a student. Um, yeah, it, re it really does help. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Stoll. I think, you know, it's um, the it's a it's an involved process, <laughs> I guess I just want to say, and I appreciate having the opportunity this evening for us to kind of really look at that and unpack that because what you see over time is we are in a school system that is moving towards more equitable um, opportunities for our students and keep in mind that it's a journey, right? Because there was a point in time where um, schools that had magnet programs, there was the admission processes were um, not standardized and they were uh, developed at the schools and you could have the same type of program, but with significantly different criteria to try to get access. Um, and so um, we have been working thoughtfully in partnership with schools with programs to begin to really standardize that. So again, it's uh, that our programs are organized in a way that um, it's um, access um, that's more, um, I guess, fair, right? Because here's the danger, here's the precaution that we need to be um, aware of is that this could easily become a system whereby students are, um, students who have um, unfair advantages are um, leapfrogging over students who, who don't have those advantages, right? And so we know that we, we wanna set up systems that are not inequitable, but systems that provide greater opportunity. You know, the lottery at the middle school level is controversial. People were not happy necessarily with that, right? And especially in all you dance as an example, if, if, you know, if I'm a mother and I have paid for my child to be in dance, I have been investing in that, right? And I kind of want that advantage. Um, but we do think that it's, it's more appropriate for that child who doesn't have those advantages. Um, and again, we look for that potential um, as opposed to those who have already had mastery. Um, and so, you know, it's a journey to move a community and a system from traditional practices um, towards new practices that open up access. So I just wanna share that with you because, um, you know, there are people who are not happy with some of the moves that we have made, but we have made them in the best interest of students having opportunity um, and not being unfairly excluded because they didn't have uh, additional advantage outside of um, their their talent and their capacity. The challenges, I think, could you go to the slide that shows the number of applications versus seats that we have? Thank you, Mr. Corns. So I just would like everyone, if you could take a moment, look at this. We have just shy of 7,000 students pursuing our seats and magnets and look at the seats, 3,600. So there is tremendous interest. Um, and so of course that's gonna create a highly competitive um, drive, right? You know, supply and demand. We have a huge demand and we have a limited supply. Um, and so it really is our responsibility to, to try to create systems of access that are um, fair uh, for students 
um, regardless of their social economic background or whatever whatever systems and structures they have outside of the school schoolhouse. I hope that that adds um, some thought to the conversation, Mr. Thomas. It does, Dr. McComas, and I'd like to share that when I was applying to college applications, I remember initially being so frustrated by the lottery system, knowing that yeah. you know I didn't have control over yeah. whether right. or not I get into any program, especially mm -hmm. after I didn't get into a program in middle school um, and that program. But looking now as someone who's gone through the magnet program and sitting in the lens of a board member, like I think that some of the I'm referencing down to the 20 percent of rule for high school things, I, I feel as though that again creates one of those uh, barriers, one of those advantages to students that have had opportunities when the purpose of magnet programs aren't to just create a cultivate a, a learning space that is of the best of the best students who are achieving at the most level who are great at tests. You know, the purpose is to create theme related curricula and instructional programs that are incubators for innovative instructional practices. And so um, I, that's something that I just wanted to bring up and, and, and to discuss. Uh, and now, like I can say, my sibling is going through the same process, and my my mom is frustrated that there's no control over how where 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 my other sibling will go. But I think as we move to this more equitable uh, structure with magnet programs, we are kind of getting rid of the idea that you have to go to a magnet program to be successful. That so many students in BCPS do have the perception of, or that this the magnet program at a different school would make the difference in your educational experience instead of going to one's home school. Um, and so I, I, I'm proud of the equitable process. I, I'm proud of the, the lottery uh, program that we have for middle schools right now. Um, I just think that we can continue moving in that direction. And I know that it does take a, a lot of uh, feedback from the public, some negative feedback from people that can't control the situation. Um, but thank you for, for presenting this and for sharing all of that information. You're, you're most welcome. And I really truly appreciate the opportunity this evening um, with this committee because uh, specifically to discuss uh, magnet with a lens of equity because it is, um, you know, what we don't want to do is we don't want students to, uh, we don't want to create within our total community uh, first class and second class citizens, right? Those who have, you know, managed to make it through all these rigorous um, gates, if you will, that if you have the right advantage, you can make the gate. And if you don't have the right advantage, you're left behind. We don't want that for our children. We know that um, they deserve better. Um, our challenge, our true challenge is our demand so exceeds our seat capacity at this point. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Uh, there's uh, facility constraints, right? Buildings can only hold but so many student bodies, right? Uh, transportation, getting students, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to say, let's create a program over here, but then we need to figure out how do we get students from their neighborhood? over to that opportunity, right? So there are very real constraints that we are working with uh, to build out our magnet programs, to allow them to be accessible, at least within our zones, right? Um, and then um, to create more seat seating opportunity in magnet programs. That's why we were really grateful for the Magnet Schools Assistance mm -hmm. Program grant, because we had kind of reached a, a cliff, or a, I shouldn't say cliff, but like a, a wall. Like we had kind of gone as far as we could manage, um, and that grant allowed us to continue to stretch just a little bit further to open up a little bit more access. And so, you know, part of this is um, in my dream world, uh, and this will not happen before I retire, but in my dream world, what if, what if every facility in Baltimore County had a magnet program? What if the environment was so rich and so robust and so saturated with magnet opportunities uh, that uh, that equitable access becomes so much easier, right? And it's not a matter of safeguarding to make sure that we don't create a, a, a privileged um, context, but that we create a truly um, accessible uh, opportunity for students to pursue coursework of their interest and their passion, even if they pursue it for a little bit and decide it's not the direction they want to go. Uh, I'll. Um, use myself as an example. I grew up in Baltimore City, proud graduate of city schools. Um, I graduated from Baltimore Polytechnic Institute. It was a, a STEM magnet um, and I am so grateful for those four years in the A course at Poly because what I learned was that I did not want to be an engineer. I learned that 
my calling and my real passion lied outside and I didn't have to spend four years of college tuition figuring that out, right? I was able to figure that out ahead of time. Um, and so I, I really want that opportunity for every child. I mean, how amazing could it be if every child could pursue a, a field of study or a, a pathway of study um, to find out, is that really my calling or is that, uh, you know, know what? I've tried that. Now I want to go someplace else. So I'll get off my um, <laughs> talking because I get excited about the possibilities ahead, not so much where we've been or even where we are today, but where the possibilities lie for our, our children and magnet programs. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. McComas. And I have I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Christian. I, I can email them over since I know that uh, we are running short on time. So thank you. Dr. Green. Uh, uh, I just wanted to mention if it's OK uh, from a personal perspective and also this idea of Mr. Thomas of you being an ambassador. So I heard you mention briefly that you know there are some perceptions that magnet schools are somehow better than all the other schools. And you know my personal experience is that I have twins and, and Christian, you're friends with one of them, but not the other one. That's because one chose to go to school with you and one chose not to. And um, you know I think and when I think about why he chose not to go to Eastern Tech is because they actually didn't have something that his school offered. So I know one of the perceptions that people have is that magnet schools have everything plus. And in some cases, magnet programs or schools that have magnet programs might not have something that a comprehensive school has. So continue to be an ambassador for we want all of our schools to be the best schools in the country as opposed to magnet schools are somehow better because of the name. Thanks. An excellent point. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fasture, you had a comment? Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll pull off of what Dr. Elmendorf just said. Now, having been one of the APs who did the planning year and opened both Carver and Sudbrook, back way back when we were selecting the students, I can certainly, um, I can certainly validate the point that someone made earlier um, that there is a difference and um, what the schools look like and what they should look like because the truth of the matter is we got to see all of the children as they applied and performed and did whatever it was they were doing. Um, and to sift through, even though we were supposed to be picking the names out randomly, but even if we did that, we knew that the children at the end of the day were had similar quality and it wasn't always by um let's be clear, for, for real it wasn't always by what the economics were in terms of their lives we had students who were awesome um who came awesome and they did not have the years and years of experience like others but the reality is we opened up both of those schools opened up um knowing that we could do almost anything with the children because it was like this. We were not growing in the same way, children. And then being at Randallstown, watching students who came into a community school, which was very different from Carver and Sudbrook because they were whole, they weren't community schools. So now you have children who are applying for programs in a community school, and some of those students did not get in the program. So when um, Christian talks about that equity and all of us talk about that equity, it's the mindset because I can say it now because I sit on the board and I'm well retired, that when there were children who really had that interest, but for whatever reason, they didn't get selected from the, the magnet office, we allowed them to be able to take some of those courses. And I'm proud to say that there are children out there today, particularly in mass comm, who are on the radio, on television, doing the writing at uh, um, major in major markets who didn't get selected, but they still had the opportunity. So I think Dr. Elmendorf said it, um, to be able, there are some schools, community schools that have programs uh, and, and these children can participate in them. But it's also about 
that's where um, Christian gets that notion because we fought a whole lot of folks along the journey who had that perception, had it and still have it, that a magnet school is better or that one magnet school is different or does better than another. And that's why we've had children from one side of the county who will ride all the way over past a wonderful magnet program trying to get into that school. So we have to do better as well with our marketing and what we say. And the word magnet is almost to me now like the word equity. Everybody, if you want to be politically correct, you can just throw that out there. But all of our schools should be outstanding schools. And we can't put a magnet uh, program in every school because we don't even know what the children would want. So that's why we put them in some schools and they don't, they fail. So we have to have more, this is a great conversation. We have to have more conversations like this, but with parents and in our schools so that folks understand what it means. It doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It just means it's an area of opportunity. And in our schools, just sort of exhaling sometime and just saying, if this child really has this passion and is demonstrating just a little bit, just saying, I know I can do this then giving them those opportunities if they're in that school as um, as opposed to closing the door. And we do have to tell the truth. I've been in, I was in Baltimore County long before you were in Baltimore County. So I've seen the good, the bad and the ugly. And we have got to change what the image of the magnet school is and what the purpose of it is. And so we want to have good programs in our schools. That's my dream. That's my dream, that we have wonderful programs in all schools so that children don't think that one program somewhere else is better. So Dr. Elmendorf, I'm coming back to you. I applaud you and your sons that they had the option and the understanding. We don't have to be in a magnet school to be well educated. Our magnet schools are programs are wonderful, but that needs to happen to make a first class system that has to happen all over the system. And that's my passion because I've seen it on both sides and experienced it on both sides. And we have to be at the ready for all of our children as much as possible, wherever they are in their journey and, 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 and recognize that. I, I do hope have that to make some sense, but it's my but, it's, yes, ma'am. I do have to say that being twins with one car, it would have been easier if they went to the same school. But I'm glad they, oh, they're yeah. where, they're well, now where they want to be. <laughs> you know, you're a parent. Too bad. Okay, suck it up. <laughs> but you made them. You raised them to be able to think on their own, and that's what they did. Bravo. And we have chill. And the other piece, the last piece is because this is the piece I got from. Uh, Sudbrook all the time when we changed to just the lottery and the guidelines as people thought went out is that it happened quickly. So I'm hoping, I, I think now we sort of have it because I heard someone say it where we were prepping our teachers and they're helping them to understand you might well now get some students who have never picked up that instrument or never danced with a private teacher or whatever in a group. And so now we have to be prepared, you have to be prepared to meet your students on all levels. And the mark of who you are is being able to see those children grow. I think we're doing that better, much better now than we did when in the middle school when we took some of the criteria mm -hmm. away. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any comments on what Ms. Pastor said? I just want to say thank you, Ms. Pastor, because I think you're right. There's, and this is to uh, Mr. Thomas's point, you know, as we move to try to create the most equitable 
system we can, it takes time to make changes that have been really entrenched for long times, right? Like you, it, it takes, there's a process. You have to prepare people for the change. You have to, com, you know, communicate and help the community understand. And I think I just want to say thank you, Ms. Pasture, because I know I have been in these conversations uh, with you around uh, the changes at Sudbrook and helping others understand um, the what, why, um, and how, and um, appreciate your your comment that we are improving on that. So thank you. Um, and to follow up on that, my, my two questions that should be fast. <laughs> I mean, one is, uh, what year was it that the change happened with the the lottery, especially in the middle school? Yeah. Roughly. I have to defer to Miss Schubert or Mr. Stoll. I I. Uh, Five years ago, maybe it's longer than that. It's Five longer. I, it, it, I think it happened. Let's see. I'm now ten years retired, so I know it happened after I retired, and I retired in 2012. So. Well, my, my point is, I guess um, the the histograms that you provided with the with the demographic data were helpful, but would would be really helpful would be the pre and post that change because that was a change that was made to improve the equity. Um, the equitable distribution of the pop of the students that are in these programs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, perhaps uh, it would be, I think, probably very promising to see that what changes were made stemming from that policy change. Um, and in addition, what the equity goals were going into that change. So what, what was the hope? What it, was it to um, mirror the image of Baltimore County schools or was it to enhance representation of, of groups within our school system who had been historically underrepresented in these programs. So again, whatever those whatever those equity goals were when we went into it, have we been able to address it with the current policy or does that need to be revisited? So um, well, Dr. Hager um, and, and Mr. Thomas and whoever else chimed in is right. It, it happened right before this board came on. So that's about five. So but know that you said um, equity. It came out of a lawsuit, so maybe some of you, And but the lawsuit ironically wasn't about Sudbrook. It actually had to do with Eastern and Western, but it was pushed back. Now I can be fact checked on that, but I'm pretty sure I'm sort of accurate. Uh, um, so it was like other things, pushed back to the middle school so the students would be prepared when by the time they got to high school, but it, it did come from disgruntled parents actually who felt that their children were not getting into the school and that maybe there was a racial bias or whatever. I do I believe it was five years ago, but Mr. Stoll has a far better memory than I do. And Ms. Pester, you are correct. Um, it was um, there was an OCR complaint at the high school level. Um, but also the, the root of that change at the middle school level, we did focus groups with families and, and families told us, you know, that um, they wanted to shift to a, a more um, equitable process where 11 year olds weren't required to have mastery of a, 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 um, a magnet concept when going into middle school. So good yeah. memory, Ms. Bestuer. Uh Oh, I wish we could keep this conversation going for a long time. Um, this meeting was only supposed to be an hour, so we're at our time. Um, maybe uh, if there was any additional information that could be provided in the weekly update, or if we did want to revisit this at another time, I, you know, I think it's a great conversation. Or um, I know Mr. Handy wanted to talk a little bit about our next um, advisory meeting, and, and I know that one of the topics discussed um, for the advisory council would have been magnet programs as well. So that might be another route for continuing this conversation. So, Mr. Handy, did you want to um, talk about our January meeting? Sure. Um, thank you, Dr. Hager. And before I move on to that meeting, I just want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Elmendorf, Ms. Schubert, Mr. Stoll for their presentation this evening. I um, want to really thank the committee members for their time and their attention to these topics. Um, these are topics you all chose, so I appreciate you all um, you know, digging in and really having some robust discussion. So, uh, it's been a pleasure to observe the proceedings. Um, I've been in many a conversation about Magnet, as my Magnet colleagues know, and there'll be several others. And um, had the pleasure of working in, you know, uh, Dr. McComas' division and having plenty of discussions. So, um, really um, appreciate what's what's happened up to this point. I really want to talk about January's meeting. Uh, we do have uh, the advisory uh, council meeting 
slated for January and by the committee's request, we wanted to go early in January. So uh, my proposal was for us to meet on Thursday, uh, January 13th from 530 to 7. And if we look at the full board meeting on January 11th, that is where Dr. Williams is planning to present uh, the budget. Um, so I figured that would be good timing, budget presentation on the 11th, and then that gives us time with the committee and the council on the 13th um, to talk about those budget matters, which is something the committee asked for. So I uh, just wanted to propose that and see what, what you all thought about that. That works for me. I don't know what other people want to thumbs up or chime in. I have a question, uh, Mr. Handy. Yes, sir. So I, as a member of the Equity Advisory Council as well, since I, I, a member of that, uh, which I know brings some confusion sometimes, um, I'm pretty sure you sent an email out scheduling an Equity Advisory Council meeting for that same day, the 13th. Correct, correct. So what Mr. Thomas is referring to, and I probably need to clean that up because, right, so you're kind of wearing two hats. I, right, being okay. a board member. And then so Mr. Thomas did get, I gave the heads up to the council along with the information that you all asked that I share with them, which was the resources to help them prepare. So some budget resources, um, policy 0100, the resources you all asked for. Um, so Mr. Thomas, I the original, so we're talking about the same meeting, so yes. Yeah. Okay, the same, okay, thank you, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, that right. works perfectly for me. Save the date, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually will not, I cannot attend on the 13th. Um, I'll try to chime in towards the end, uh, but that is when we are screening applications for the next student member of the board. Um, so uh, there's a conflict for me, I can, I, I probably won't be able to attend, um, but I, if it's published live or I, I'll be able to look back at it, if not, then I'll, uh, I can touch base with the board members to hear feedback. Uh, Ms. Mack and Ms. Pasture, what is would that work for you as members of that? Yeah, group? I gave a thumbs up. Sorry, I missed. I guess my life has changed, but I guess so. <laughs> It'll be a busy evenings in January for sure. It's all about the school board. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, Mr. Thomas, I, I'm sorry, and ho hopefully you can maybe chime in at the end, like you said, and and uh, and but but that does seem like a good date given the budget presentation on Tuesday, to uh, be able to hear back from our council um, as we work through the budget throughout January. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank you uh, to the committee members. Um, I'll make sure I work with um, Ms. Gover and get that invitation sent out so it's official on everyone's um, calendars and then uh, we'll be prepared, be prepared once we come back from our, our winter break. So. Oh, uh, Doc, uh, Mr. Handy, can we, the committee, um, have get a copy of the letter that you send, the materials you send, send out to uh, the council members? Please. Yes, yes, ma'am, Ms. Pastor, I will do that for all the um, committee members. I'll get that to you um, probably this evening because I've got that already sent, so it's a matter of forwarding to you. So I would certainly take care of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Wonderful. All right, is there any further business to discuss? Ms. Mack, do you have something? No. Okay, so since there is no further business, I will declare the meeting adjourned. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight and we hope you have a wonderful holiday.